in the next 30 minutes, we'll take a look at the university's plans to install a Starbucks on top of the Washington Square Arch, which would make it the 987 Starbucks in a three-block radius. We have the inside scoop campus. After the wardrobe malfunction seen around the world, Janet Jackson decides to clean up her act. We'll take a look at the musical acts you can catch this weekend at the bottom line. Uh, never mind. And we'll also have a look at your beautiful weekend forecast. It's Thursday, April 1st, 2004. You're watching NYU Tonight. I'm Ara Cho. And I'm Janelle Menendez. Here are your top stories. Deadly violence continues to rage in Iraq, with few signs that coalition forces are putting an end to the attacks that leave U.S. personnel and Iraqi civilians dead and wounded nearly every day. The latest attack, a Humvee burned near Fallujah this morning after the three American soldiers on board managed to escape the blast of a roadside bomb. The, first was, the fire was started afterwards by looters. Earlier, six Iraqis died in an explosion at a busy marketplace in the town of Ramadi. Today's violence comes right on the heels of another brutal day in Iraq for Americans. Fallujah was the scene of an ambush yesterday that left four civilian contractors dead and their bodies dragged through the streets by a mob. Two of the bodies were later found hanging from a bridge. Five U.S. soldiers also died on Wednesday when a bomb blew up under an armored personnel carrier. It was the bloodiest day in Iraq for Americans since January 8th. The top U.S. administrator in Iraq, L. Paul Bremer, told a graduating class of Iraqi police cadets that the events in Fallujah are, quote, dramatic examples of the ongoing struggle between human dignity and barbarism, end quote. Meanwhile, Colin Powell said on a German television station that the United States would not be run out of Iraq. The federal government has expanded the rights of unborn babies. President Bush signed the fetus protection bill today, making it a crime to harm a fetus during an assault on a pregnant woman. Opponents of the bill argued this is the first time federal law has recognized an embryo or fetus as a separate person and could be used in the future to challenge abortion rights. This bill comes after the highly publicized murder case of Lacey Peterson and her unborn child. Lacey's mother and stepfather were present for the signing of the bill. President Bush may have started down the road to vetoing his first bill yesterday. He's threatening to veto the proposed Highway Improvement Bill. The president states he is trying to reduce the deficit by rejecting any proposal over $256 billion. Legislators are asking for approximately $284 billion to improve highways, build bridges, and parking garages. They are still debating over the cost of the bill and the manner of its distribution. A missing University of Wisconsin student was found alive in a marshy area in Madison after disappearing four days ago. 20-year-old Audrey Sealer was allegedly kidnapped at knife point after leaving her apartment, police say. After passerby spotted Sealer and contacted authorities, they sealed off the area and began searching streets, parking lots, and nearby woods looking for a suspect. While friends and family say they never gave up hope they would find Sealer alive, some in the community are sh starting to doubt Sealer's story. Despite the unanswered questions, police are standing behind Sealer. Again, we have the facts that are presented and we're investigating it. We have no reason to doubt it at this time. Sealer said this is not the first time something like this has happened to her. She claims she awoke in a deserted building after being attacked from behind in February, but was not seriously hurt. Police are continuing their investigation. Investigators are searching for two men for allegedly firing shots at a car last night in Brooklyn, killing a two-year-old boy. The toddler was sitting in the front seat of the car when he was shot in the head. The child's father and a male friend were also shot and remain hospitalized. The boy's brother and sister were also sitting in the car, but sustained only minor injuries. We can expect tailgating and touchdowns on the west side in the not-so-distant future, but not everybody is happy with the cost. Julie Delgado has that story. Plans for the expansion of the Jacob Javits Convention Center were given the go-ahead last week. 
The project will include a 75,000-seat stadium for the New York Jets and will be an anchor in New York City's bid for the 2012 Olympics. But financing the $2.8 billion project is causing some controversy. City Council members gathered on the steps of City Hall yesterday to object to the mayor's redistribution of $300 million intended for affordable housing to help pay for the project. The point we are here today to make is to say, whatever you do to build that stadium, do not steal money from the Affordable Housing Fund to do it, because that's what this amounts to. The Battery Park City revenue has been specifically dedicated for affordable housing. The needs of low-income New Yorkers, of homeless New Yorkers, of doubled and tripled up New Yorkers is much more important, those housing needs, than the needs of the Jets. That's where the priorities of this city should be. But advocates of the plan maintain that the reallocated funds and $90 million is expected to cost taxpayers and debt service will come full circle. The project is expected to create 40,000 construction jobs, 20,000 permanent jobs, and generate anywhere between 80 to 120 million dollars to New York City's tax revenue. If people can have jobs, they will be able to, I think, uh, afford their own uh, housing. So, create, uh, building a new stadium will create, generate jobs. I think it's a good thing. And it's just, it's just typical. It's just very typical of um, it's politicians pandering to big business and big money. So I think uh, between all the great minds and uh, the owners and of the Jets and Mayor Bloomberg and going to Pataki, they could come up with something, a better idea. Gas prices hit a record high this week of $1.75 per gallon nationwide and $2.13 per gallon in California. The Energy Department and White House held a meeting on Saturday to discuss how to respond to the rising prices, which are expected to spike even higher this summer. And yesterday, OPEC, the world's largest group of oil suppliers, announced it will cut production by 4% per day starting today, which may also cause prices to surge. It's not clear if there's anything the White House can do in the short term to stop the rise in price. As long as crude prices keep rising like this, gas prices will likely follow suit. The stock market rose today with large gains in, te in technology. The Dow rose to 15.63, and the Nasdaq rose more than 1% to 20.78 in the new quarter's first trading day. National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice will testify under oath next Thursday before the federal panel reviewing the 9-11 attacks. Much of the questions are expected to focus on, the, on what outgoing Clinton officials told her about the threat of al-Qaeda and her response. At first, Rice had resisted testifying publicly, citing legal concerns. However, Rice finally agreed after the Commission and Congress promised her that the decision would not be seen as a legal precedent that might force other presidential advisors to do the same. The Republican National Committee has launched a legal attack against two dozen political groups to get anti-Bush ads off the air. A complaint was filed yesterday with the Federal Election Commission accusing political groups like MoveOn.org of illegally coordinating advertising against Bush with John Kerry's campaign. The Republicans also charged the Democrats are violating the Bipartisan Campaign Re Finance Reform Act by using soft money to pay for these ads, which was outlawed in, the act by two th in 2002. Kerry's camp denies having anything to do with the ads or the groups that run them. Will NYU face an adjunct strike before semester's end? For that story and more, here's Charles Wade. Thanks, Ara. The stakes were raised this week in negotiations between NYU's adjunct professors and the university as the adjuncts begin voting whether or not to strike later in the semester. If two-thirds or more approve a strike by April 12th, a bargaining committee from the United Auto Workers Local 7902, which represents the part-time faculty, will then be able to call a strike at any time. The possibility of a strike follows almost 18 months of difficult and slow-moving contract negotiations. But what are the key issues in this dispute? While NYU adjuncts want a pay increase to $8,400 for a three-hour course per semester, the university has offered less than $3,000, which would annually increase after the first year. 
Adjuncts have asked for the same health care coverage promised to the full-time faculty, while the university has proposed payment of 66% of the cost for individual health care benefits. While the adjuncts want a guarantee to teach the same course after a two-semester probationary period, the university offers, quote, good faith consideration after the probationary period has ended. Also at stake is course ownership, or the right to teach exclusively a class an adjunct has developed. So what can students expect if a strike occurs? The university has developed a contingency plan, which includes having full-time faculty or a substitute professor cover an adjunct class until the adjunct returns. Other options include videotaped lectures, the cancellation of classes, or the rescheduling of them to the fall. But NYU officials are against any measures that would keep students from graduating or hold them back a semester. The lack of a campus often prevents unity among students. What is the school doing to promote unity? Elizabeth Yoon has a story. The Department of Residential Education has started a new project called Explorations that allows students to request housing among people who share similar interests. I live on the music hall in Goddard, and I figured I'd take advantage of that. So we have a fantastic guitar player named Gabe, um, and also a fantastic congo player named Oliver from Hawaii. The Center for Music Performance has also joined the effort to promote campus unity. A coffeehouse series was created for students who love music to come and perform their original works. Playing anywhere is a really good experience, even if you don't meet anyone, just to, for the practice, you know, it's the best way to get stronger. But then, you know, networking is the best way to go about things, the best way to meet people. It's social, but it's, it's also nice to come out. The Coffeehouse series, which began in the fall of 2003, was originally held at venues such as Commuter Commons or the Ultraviolet Cafe. Although the cafe didn't succeed as a restaurant, it was a popular venue among clubs and performers. That's where I prefer to have it, just because like the sound was always so good, the atmosphere was great. But it works here as well. Um, it's not quite as accessible being not right on the corner, right at the park. But the younger generation actually liked the space provided at Kimmel. I was actually really pleased with the venue and the turnout and uh, the skyline. <laughs> always makes it nice. If you think you've got talent or would like to meet others with a passion for music, come and apply to be a performer. Or if you'd just like to take a break from all the studying, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. The next series is scheduled for April 20th. For NYU Tonight, this is Elizabeth Yoon. The Housing Department announced yesterday that renovations to Weinstein Residence Hall are being put on hold until the end of the semester after construction caused dangerous fumes and dust to seep into students' rooms. A memo about, a memo about the work stoppage was sent to all Weinstein residents and RA citing, quote, continuing student com complaints and inclement weather. Renovations will resume after exams on May 17th and will continue for 8 to 10 weeks. NYU officials announced yesterday that they have worked out a plan to allow students to sign themselves in and out of certain residence halls next fall, but the select buildings are still unknown. The new policy marks a third sign-in policy change in two years and will create hall clusters allowing residents of a group of neighboring dorms to move more freely, freely between buildings. Now visiting students will simply verify that their host lives in the building and then leave their NYU cards at the desk. Officials say they have decided to test the program on a smaller scale and are first considering the six all-freshman residence halls. Thanks, Charles. Lawyers for Martha Stewart filed papers in federal court yesterday contending that her guilty verdict should be overturned. The reason being that juror Chappelle Hartridge lied on his questionnaire, so the lawyers feel that Martha should be granted a new trial. The papers state that Hartridge failed to disclose that he had been arrested and charged with physically abusing his girlfriend. The girlfriend filed a report with the New York Police Department. Stewart's attorneys say a new trial was warranted because Hartridge would have been kicked off the panel had he been truthful on his juror questionnaire. Stewart was convicted on March 5th of obstructing justice, conspiracy, and lying to investigators about her sale of stock in the biotech firm Imclone. She will be sentenced June 17th. The murder trial of former NBA star Jason Williams continued today in New Jersey. The latest development is his refusal to testify. 
Understand my rights. Under the advice of my counsel, I will not testify. I am innocent. I put my trust in God, and I have great confidence in his jury. His defense team claims the murder was an accident, while the prosecution claims Williams recklessly handled the gun, which killed limousine driver Costas Christoffi. The girlfriend of mobster Peter Gotti, brother of the late mob boss John Gotti, was found dead of a possible suicide on Wednesday, police said. The body of 43-year-old Marjorie Alexander was discovered in a Long Island hotel room after police say she was reported missing by her family on Tuesday. According to the New York Post, Alexander wrote letters to the judge asking for leniency in a case against Peter Gotti. He is currently awaiting sentencing for a racketeering conviction and is reported to be devastated over the loss. Here with the latest news from Tinseltown, here's Jeannie Fernandez. This week, rumor has it that Britney may be headed to China. That's right, America's pop princess and her managers are negotiating a takeover of the Far East. It looks like this girl turned woman has also grown up to be a very smart entrepreneur. And these days, Janet Jackson seems to always be flashing something new. Luckily for us, it wasn't her breast this time. According to sources, Janet had a huge yellow diamond ring on her wedding finger, which she wore on two different interviews this week. Although the star did not confirm to be the new Mrs. Germaine Dupri, she didn't deny it either. Talk about not putting your bling where your mouth is. And the cast of the hit show The Simpsons is reportedly on strike when negotiations with the Fox network broke down. Apparently, the voices behind TV's favorite family have not shown up for their last two table reads. The actors want more than $360,000 per episode, or $8 million each for the entire season. Talk about being greedy. And who knew the White House and hip-hop could have anything in common? Well, if presidential candidate John, John Kerry wins the election, it just might. In an interview with MTV, John Kerry said, I am fascinated by rap and hip-hop. The presidential candidate said he respected the music for its poetry, anger, and social energy. Hmm, I wonder if he's planning on having Eminem produce a song for his campaign. And that's all for tonight's entertainment news. I'm Jeannie Fernandez. Back to you, Ara. Thanks. The procession has started. Time to walk down the aisle into your future. Graduation is approaching, but are you ready? It's almost graduation time. For many, it's the day you've all been waiting for. But for many drama majors at Tisch, the countdown is terrifying. Do they have acting jobs? No, I don't. I plan on trying to break into the business, but more than likely we'll be bartending or waiting tables. The Office of Career Services, right next to Tisch, claims to be there to help all students get a job. And our goal is obviously for folks to have gainful employment upon graduation. With flyers advertising jobs and information galore, it seems impossible to be unemployed. Even if students can't get to the office itself, CareerNet is an NYU online listserv, which lists jobs for all departments, except for actors, many of whom have never sought help from the university. You know, we're the ones who have to get ourselves work, particularly in this field, like no one can just give you a job. You know, NYU is not a place where you're getting handed things left and right. You have to fight for things. You have to be competitive about it. And, you know, that is, is responsibility, is priority first up. So is there anything Tish should do to get acting students a job? Well, they told us all we were going to be showcased our senior year. You have to audition for the showcase, and very few people get in, and a lot of it, I feel, is political. For NYU Tonight, I'm Brooks Hornsby. Video games, too over the top or just reflecting the violence in our society? Here's Liz Sabia weighing in with her thoughts. Thanks, Ara. From the Atari 2600 to the Sony PS2, people have been playing video games for years and it shows no signs of slowing down. Today, the graphics have become so much more advanced and games mimic real-life situations. However, with the emergence of new technologies comes controversy. Joining television and movies, the gaming industry has come under fire for the amount of violence that they portray. 
Many politicians and psychologists have come down hard on video game developers, saying that many of their games promote the use of weaponry and increased aggression. They say that long exposure to these games lead to violent tendencies and withdrawal from the real world for adolescents. For example, many are saying that Rockstar Games' newest release, Manhunt, has gone too far. In it, the character uses a wide range of weapons, from axes to machetes to plastic bags. The game even allows you to perform vivid executions. In my opinion, it is quite disturbing and inappropriate regardless of age. However, sales of this game and others like it have not slackened, and they're flying off the shelves. What does this say about our society? As with television and movies, there is a rating system in place letting parents and game vendors know what content the game has. Yet, why is it possible for a 14-year-old to walk into a store and buy a copy of Capcom's Resident Evil when the seller knows the game is rated mature and clearly says on the cover that it contains graphic violence? And why are parents allowing their children the opportunity to buy these games? Isn't it the parents' job to monitor the games that their children are playing? And shouldn't video game sellers require ID for people under the age of 17 to buy a mature rated game, just like movie ticket sellers? Our news is filled with violence and graphic content, and yet we don't censor that. Do I think some games like Manhunt go too far? Certainly, but you don't have to buy the game, and if you are a parent, you should ensure your child does not get his, his or her hands on it. But for those of us who understand the difference between reality and fantasy, why shouldn't we be able to buy these games? Violence is everywhere, and we can't change that. Until we become a more peaceful nation, video games, TV, and movies are going to reflect real life, and violence is a part of our real life. But hey, that's just my opinion. Ara, back to you. Thank you. A catamaran headed to Rochester sustained minimal damage today when it struck a lower Manhattan tier while docking. The $42.5 million vessel was on its way to begin service as a high-speed car and passenger ferry leaving from Rochester, New York and arriving in Ontario, Canada. The Australian-built boat suffered a 25-foot gash on its starboard side, but no injuries were reported. Ferry officials said the vessel will remain in New York City for repairs before resuming its voyage. New York returns to full recycling today after a two-year absence. The Department of Sanitation put flyers in Sunday's paper, newspaper last weekend. Along with that, they ran some announcements to remind New Yorkers of the new recycling program. In spite of this, they feel that many will be unprepared. To simplify the process, the Sanitation Department changed the old alternate pickup schedule and made the pickups every week. There are also new changes to the program which include placing glass jars and bottles in the same container as plastic and metal items. In addition to that, Bundling paper and cardboard should be separate from glass, plastic, and metal. For more information on the new policies, check the website at www.nyc.gov sanitation. And for your local weather, it looks like you better keep that umbrella handy because April showers have come in full force. Rain will continue to fall tonight through Friday. As for the weekend and the beginning of next week, the rain will start to clear up for a bit on Saturday, but will return again on Sunday and will carry through Monday. The Yankees are trying to get back on the right foot after losing the first major league game of the season, and a professional hockey player hangs up his stick. Now on those stories and other sports highlights with Ryan McGinnis. Thanks, Ara. First, it was Rush Limbaugh on Donovan McNabb. Now, NFL Hall of Famer Paul Horning has sparked anger this week for something he said about recruiting black athletes to his alma mater, Notre Dame. We can't stay as strict as we are as far as the <laughs> academic structure is concerned because we got to get the black athlete. We must get the black athlete if we're going to compete. It was kind of offensive, just basically saying that um, African-American students couldn't get into the school without uh, standards being lowered. After being flooded with responses like that one from friends and the media, the 1956 Heisman Trophy winner apologized for his remarks. Yesterday, Horning said he was wrong and should have said it's really tough for all athletes, black and white, to get into Notre Dame, one of the top academic universities in the nation. According to NCAA statistics, 44% of Division I football players are African American. 
The Yankees avenged their opening day loss to the Devil Rays in Japan in a big way. Hideki Matsui came home to make a triumphant return with a two-run shot that brought the house down. The statistical star was Jorge Posada, who belted a pair of three-run homers, one from each side of the plate. Yanks rolled 12-1 as Kevin Brown earns his first win in pinstripes. Don't say it's the curse. The Boston Red Sox will start the season without Nomar Garcia Para. An injured Achilles tendon will sideline the star shortstop for at least three weeks. Tough break considering the Sox face their arch nemesis, the Yankees, seven times in that time span. I guess the Boston fans will blame the evil empire for this too. Should former Ohio State running back Maurice Claret be allowed to enter the NFL draft? That's the question a federal appeals court will answer less than a week before the draft. A lower court ruled football's eligibility rule violated antitrust law. However, a reversal of that decision will be detrimental to Claret and other draft hopefuls. By entering the draft, they lost their college eligibility. What a farewell for New York Rangers captain Marc Messier. He was given a hero salute as he scored a goal during what may have been his final home game at Madison Square Garden. Messier said after the game that he is considering retirement, but he has not decided whether he will end his 25-year career. The Rangers lost the game 4-3 to the Buffalo Sabres. Fans and players from both teams cheered him on with a standing ovation after the game. If you think NASCAR racing looks exciting on TV, try watching it on a movie screen eight stories high. NASCAR 3D, the IMAX experience, is a behind-the-scenes IMAX film that takes audiences into the pits and the cars, giving never-before-seen angles of a race. The movie is showing across the country, and it set an IMAX record for the highest-grossing opening weekend ever. But it's not just the fans who love the NASCAR 3D. Well, let's put it this way. I mean, it's the first time that I sat in a movie theater and from the word go had chills. 70 NYU winter sports athletes are being honored for not only excelling in the game, but in the classroom as well. These athletes were selected as University Athletic Association All Academic Honorees. The recognition is awarded to a student athlete who has completed at least one year at their current school and achieved a minimum GPA of 3.20. The NYU women's indoor track and field team have the most honorees with 15 students selected. Now let's take a look at the other honorees. That's it for sports. I'm Ryan McGinnis. Back to you. Thank you. For NYU students, today is a very important day. President John Sexton sent out yet another email with quite a surprise for the community. Reporter James Noble takes a look at the sensitive topic and found out when it comes to students' reactions, there's simply no fooling. The NYU community has seen an email like this before. The one released today by John Sexton has bad news about a tuition increase. Wow. Thank God I'm graduating. 4.8 increase. 4.1% of 40 Gs is a lot of money. That's a pretty hefty increase. Most students were shocked but you shouldn't believe everything you read. The email was a prank, an April Fool's joke from yours truly. Yet reactions from students were no joke in the matter. I think it's preposterous, personally. Another 4.1% increase that, uh, as it is, I'm paying $40,000 a year for this school. I don't know, I'm already considering maybe not spending four years here, because it's just too expensive. April's Fool's Day pranks have come a long way. Starting back in Europe in the 16th century, New Year's was on April 1st. When the Gregorian calendar was adopted, New Year's moved to January, but some people still celebrated on April 1st, the original fools. And today, any excuse to fool people is a date to remember. Today is April 1st. So, oh. Huh. So you joked us. Wow, I was waiting for this to happen all day. <laughs> Are you calling an April Fool's joke? <laughs> yes, yeah. Oh. The 1st of April, it's April Fool's Day. Oh, that's right. Is oh, this a shit. joke? Oh. <laughs> and hopefully, tuition won't really go up. Otherwise, the joke's on me. Reporting for NYU Tonight, this is James Noble. This has been another edition of NYU Tonight. We'll see you again next Thursday. I'm Janelle Menendez. And I'm Ara Cho. Have a great weekend.